Good morning, and welcome. Yeah, I like that. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the North Hills. Whatever the faith and traditions of your past, we welcome you. Whatever your theological stance, we welcome you. Whoever you are and whomever you love, we welcome you. Wherever you come from, whatever your journey has been, we welcome you, the whole of you. My name is Scott Gorham, and I'm the lay leader today. Our Sunday services are as diverse as we are, so if you are visiting our church for the first time, please come back again several times drawing, before drawing any conclusions about us. Newcomers and guests are always welcome to participate in any of our church activities. If we have any newcomers or guests with us this morning, we invite you to introduce yourselves. Please raise your hand and someone will uh, bring you a microphone. Um, my sister-in-law, Sharon Altman, is with us from La Plata, Maryland today. Is that it? That was enough. <laughs> Please join us for coffee hour following the service. Um, it's good to be together, both in person and virtually. Good morning again. And happy Easter. Thank you. See, they know how to do this. I'm Leanne Washington, and I'm pleased to be serving as the minister of this beloved community. Our Soul Matters liturgical theme for March has been the gift of transformation, and that theme has been explored in depth by our covenant groups, which are groups of less than 12 people who meet together twice a month to share their experience with the monthly theme and the monthly spiritual exercises. If you're interested, new covenant groups will form in the fall. Now, those of you who come from a Christian background know that there are four books in the canon of Christian scripture that are designated as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, who knows what the word gospel means? Raise your hand and I'll call on you. Don't everyone shout out at once. Ah, all right. Good news. Does anyone know the etymological derivation of the word gospel? That is, where does it come from? What was its original meaning? All right. I'll give you a pass on that one. The word gospel is derived from the Anglo-Saxon rendering of the Greek word euangelion and the Latin word evangelium, both of which mean good news or good telling. Okay, now that we've got that straight, who can tell me what most Christians mean when they say gospel? or good news with reference to Jesus' ministry. Again, hands. <clears throat> Go ahead. I'm guessing God's word or God's gospel. All right, anyone else? It's, it's the, the good news is that he's risen and we can all be saved. Okay. Anyone else have a variation on that? All right, so... Many Christians, if you ask them what's the good news, they would say Jesus Christ has died for our sins, the sins of all mankind. How many people have heard that said? Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. So it might surprise you to know that in three of the four Gospels, 
Jesus himself identified the good news numerous times. And here's what he said in Mark. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. In Matthew, Jesus predicted that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. So on this day, set apart to celebrate the good news of Jesus' ministry, we're going to explore just what Jesus considered the good news, both before and after his crucifixion. Now, let us join in worship. Flaming Chalice is a symbol of our faith as we join with other UU churches and fellowships in this familiar ritual. As we share the light of this chalice in our sanctuary, we also welcome those of you viewing remotely to light a chalice. As we gather in this sacred space, let us kindle the flame of our chalice, symbol of the light within each of us and the warmth of community. In our search for truth and meaning, we reflect on the concept of the kingdom of God, or as some may call it, the beloved community. It is a vision of harmony, justice, and love realized here on earth. May the glow of this chalice remind us of our commitment to creating a world where we are all valued, all are heard, and all are loved. As we prepare for today's message, let us remind ourselves that Jesus of Nazareth has survived history as a profound teacher and inspirational role model. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are willing and able and join in singing our opening hymn, O Young and Fearless Prophet, number 276 in the gray hymnal. The words will also appear on the screens.
in some places, the kingdom of God is referred to as the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of Matthew records what Jesus said when the disciples tried to shoo away some children who had come to be blessed by Jesus. He said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. He also later said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So we'll explore these statements a bit later, but for now, let's take, on, take in how children can lead us in creating the kingdom of heaven right here, right now. We invite the young and young in heart to come forward for our Time for All Ages story. How does God make things happen? Written by Rabbi Lawrence and Karen Kushner and illustrated by Don W. Majowski. And I have to say, is one of my all-time favorite stories. And is central to an altar that I created several months ago in a social justice uh, seminar that I was participating in. And I shared this with you a while ago. So I'm just going to lift it out and share it with the children. So here's the big question. How does God make things happen? Well, your family helps God make things happen. Sisters take turns on the slide, and brothers share games. And brothers and sisters help each other on the slide and share games. Very nice. So you know what I'm talking about. So watch how everyone comes together to help with dinner. Right? Do you all ever help with dinner? Okay, do you ever help clean up from dinner? Yeah, yeah that's the more important question. <laughs> so how does God make things happen? Well, your school helps God make things happen. And here are some examples where a boy reaches to help another and a girl shares her snack. Have you ever helped someone who couldn't reach? You don't share a snack? Oh, no. Ah, you're not allowed to share snacks anymore. This was written way back when. <laughs> and then here's a picture of someone sharing the swings. Do you all still go out for playground? Yeah. For playtime? Yeah. But swings aren't allowed because they're dangerous. Oh, my. <laughs> my. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what a town is? You know where you live? That's your town, the area around like your neighborhood where all the other houses are. And then maybe you go down the road a little bit and there's some businesses and that's your town. Well, your town helps God make things happen. And here's an example of a family Sharing some money with someone who needs it. And here is a picture of some people getting together to share books with kids in the hospital. Because, you know, it gets kind of boring being in the hospital. Have any of you been in a hospital? Yes, when I was just born, when I came, um, right out of my mom's jelly, I had a broken car. Oh, my goodness. Okay, and maybe somebody read to you. Uh, you got stitches. Oh, okay. Well, when you have to spend some time in the hospital, it is kind of boring. So having a good book to read or having someone read a story to you can be a real blessing. And here's a picture of some kids helping someone with a new baby 
Like, look, we have a new baby. We have Isla. Now, how does God make things happen? You can help make things happen. You can visit someone who's lonely. Or you can help pick up trash in your neighborhood or at school or here at the church. You can share a toy with someone. Oh, well, how nice. That's lovely. Have any of the rest of you ever shared a toy with a friend? I have shared my Switch, my Nintendo Was that you haven't or you have? I can attest that he has. He has. Okay. Well, that's very generous of you. You can help make things happen with your heart and your mind and your hands. Now, I believe that there is an Easter egg hunt waiting for you out in Friendship Hall. So let's sing them out. Good morning. I am Inga Burton Smith from the Lay Pastoral Care Team. During our service, we create this sacred space for sharing within our community. It is a time to share significant life passages with the congregation so that you can be held in loving care. I'll be reading the joys and sorrows this morning, and Lynn Richards will be placing a stone representing each joy or sorrow in the sand. The sand represents our congregation, supporting our sorrows and lifting up our joys. Today we have a sorrow from Aaron Terizzi. On Tuesday, Aaron's uncle, Reverend Barry Mall, passed away after a short battle with an aggressive cancer. My extended family, she says, is very close, so this hits us hard. My Uncle Barry was a beacon of hope and joy wherever he went. He was much beloved by every Methodist parish that he served in. Up until he died, he believed that the Methodist Church had made a wrong decision about homosexuality. He had been writing a letter to be published to all the ministers. My dad, Kirk, and my Aunt Pam are going to finish editing the letter for him and get it published posthumously for him. To Aaron, we say, we are holding you in our hearts. We now place one more stone in the sand for all the joys and sorrows that exist in our hearts but remain unspoken today. From far and near, please say with me our caring words that will be on your screen. Let us hold in our circle of caring each person here. Let us hold in our hearts those who are unable to be with us today. Let us hold in our memories those who have moved on. Let us find comfort in knowing that we are not alone. I invite you now into a moment of prayer and meditation. Please get comfortable in your seats and close your eyes or find a focal point, such as the flame in our chalice or something on the Easter altar. I'll begin by sharing an Easter prayer written by Ruth E. Gibson, a fellow Unitarian Universalist. And after the prayer, we'll have a few moments of silent meditation, which will be followed by the anthem. Spirit of life, 
we come together this Easter morning to rejoice in your ongoing creation around us and within us. We come to rejoice, but we come with burdens of sorrow and pain, of shape, shame and fear, of false obligation and false pride. On this Easter morning, may we discover a joyous and courageous faith enabling us to set these burdens down. We would remember the teachings of Jesus, whose words and example embodied your outreaching and unconditional love. And we acknowledge that we yearn to be touched by such love, but that we are not always ready to receive it or to give it. Our fears get in the way. We have hardened our hearts and busied our lives with cares. On this Easter morning, we pray that the heavy stones which burden us and separate us from you, spirit of life, may be rolled away, releasing our spirits to love and to a new life. Spirit of life, we confess that too often we have not taken time to search for the beauty of your creation hidden around us. As we allow such beauty to go unnoticed, we've deprived ourselves of occasions for joy and delight. On this Easter morning, we pray that our senses may come alive, ready to respond to all the beauty, the harmony, the fragrance, taste, and texture of life around us. It is the season of renewal. And all around us, everything is bursting into bloom or song. The hidden beauty of nature is preparing to unfold. On this Easter morning, we would be assured that we too have a hidden inner beauty ready to unfold reflecting the image of your creative power. Spirit of life, we pray for the courage to open ourselves to your touch, knowing that as we do, we will be changed. We will grow. But in so doing, we must leave behind the outgrown coverings which have hidden our true and most beautiful selves. Spirit of life, as we feel you flowing and pulsing within, we pray for a courageous and joyous faith empowering us to become our finest and truest selves, empowering us to see your image in our siblings, empowering us to participate with you in the creation of a new time of life in which love, justice, beauty, and peace are abundantly available to all. For this we pray. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be.
Wow. I'm always impressed by the, the talent we have here. Nice job. So, long before the young and fearless prophet Jesus of Nazareth was born, the Jewish people had been seeking a Messiah to free them from Roman oppression. The notion of a Messiah was nothing new to the Jewish people and several historic figures, most notably Cyrus the Great, had been identified as messiahs. Messiahs were expected to restore the Davidic monarchy, end warfare, gather in exile, rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and establish universal peace and justice. This is the context in which the Easter story is set. While there is a common thread, there are four distinct versions of the Easter story which vary in their details and in a few cases directly conflict with each other. That being said, here is the gist of the Easter story. Jesus was an outspoken itinerant preacher who challenged both the Jewish and Roman authorities. Though he only preached for three years, he had gathered many followers who were beginning to call him the Messiah. So both the Jewish and Roman authorities were wary and watching Jesus when an adoring crowd of his followers congregated outside the walls of Jerusalem. They were shouting praises and laying down palm fronds, signifying good, goodness and victory. As he approached Jerusalem's gates a few days before the Passover celebration. Just before Passover began, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, Judas Iscariot, accepted 30 pieces of silver from some priests in exchange for his betrayal of Jesus. He agreed to identify Jesus with a kiss. After Jesus and his disciples had eaten their Passover meal, Jesus invited them to go with him to the olive grove called Gethsemane, where he wanted to pray. While they were there in the grove, a crowd of armed men arrived. They had been sent by the priests. When they demanded Jesus, Judas walked up to him and gave him a kiss. The crowd took Jesus first to the Jewish authorities and then to the Roman authorities. Many accusations were laid against him and the Jewish authorities ultimately found him guilty of blasphemy, the act of speaking sacrilegiously about God. Because he didn't deny being either the son of God or the Messiah. The Roman authorities accepted his guilt but offered to release one prisoner either Jesus or a man named Barabbas. The crowd chose the release of Barabbas and shouted for Jesus to be crucified. So Jesus was taken to the hill called Golgotha, meaning skull, where he was placed upon a cross and was crucified alongside two criminals. One of the two criminals recognized Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Joseph of Arimathea, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, took Jesus' body down off the cross, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a cave with a large stone. The women went home to prepare spices and oils that they would apply to Jesus' body after the Sabbath. The day after the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene, Joanne, Mary the mother of James, and some other unnamed women took the spices and oils that they had prepared and went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Instead of finding Jesus' body, they found an empty tomb. Jesus had arisen from the dead. The story continues to tell how Jesus appeared to various people for 40 days after his death and then ascended into heaven on a white cloud, never to be seen in the flesh again, though he appears to people from time to time as a vision.
so the scripture goes on to say that during those 40 days, Jesus continued to preach about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. It's just a short paragraph at the beginning of Acts. But it makes clear that even after the miracle of resurrection, Jesus went about continuing to preach about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That phrase appears 53 times in the Gospels, the phrase kingdom of God, almost always coming from Jesus' mouth. The synonymous phrase, kingdom of heaven, appears 32 times in the Gospel of Matthew. Throughout the accounts of Jesus' ministry, he's always talking about the kingdom of God. And many of his parables explain something about this kingdom. It's like a mustard seed, a treasure, a merchant looking for pearls, and a king who gave a banquet. And for those of you who were raised in the Christian tradition, many of those parables are ones that you were well familiar with. But most importantly, at least in my mind, Jesus defines his purpose in light of the kingdom. And according to Luke, he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to others, for I was sent for this purpose. He didn't say, mind you, that I have to go and die for everybody's sins. I was created for that purpose. He said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, for I was sent for this purpose. Interesting, isn't it? Now, given the centrality of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven to Jesus and his ministry, it's strange that it's not more central to traditional Christian celebrations of Easter. Perhaps that's because the message of the kingdom of God is not one of passively being saved by someone else's actions or by belief in someone else's actions or by adherence to a set of beliefs about someone else's actions, but is one of individual and communal empowerment. First, we must understand what it is that Jesus is referring to when he uses the phrase kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Generally, he's referring to the experience of living in a community that values and embodies love, justice, mercy, hope, peace, and ultimately joy, where individuals and the community have agency over their lives and are empowered to find meaning in life, and to manifest their purpose in a way that will enrich them individually while also benefiting the community as a whole. It's this understanding of the kingdom of God that's been popularized and secularized as the beloved community. In my studies, I find few differences between the two visions of community. In each vision, people are empowered and liberated for the purpose of living in shared prosperity in every way that one can prosper. Without injustices, without prejudices, and without undeserved limitations. Now, we should also understand that it's in this context, kingdom doesn't refer to a place, but a type of agency and authority. So, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he's really speaking in his own time about the authority, the reign, the 
principles, and we're talking about the good principles, and yes, I am well aware that in the Hebrew scriptures, there are some really awful activities that have been attributed to God, so set that aside, all you Unitarian Universalists. And think about the God that said, be objective in your justice. Take care of the widow. Take care of the orphan. Welcome the sojourner in your midst, for you too may one day be a stranger in a strange land. Think of that version of God. And when you do, you'll understand that what Jesus is saying is that really all those good teachings about how to be good human beings in community with each other are really dependent on us, not on some other force swooping in and imposing on us a community that shares these characteristics, but rather we, individually and as together, are empowered to create such a community. Now, another way uh, that this idea has been interpreted in the scripture is Jesus says the kingdom, there are two ways to understand the following. The kingdom of God is within you. That same Greek word could mean among. And so the kingdom of God is among you. So people tend to choose one interpretation or the other. I kind of like both. Because if the kingdom of God is within me, that means that I can find the experience of justice and love and compassion in my own life, regardless of what else is going on out there. And in my own most intimate relationships, regardless of what the greater society is saying I should be focused on. Individuality, competition, material accumulation. The kingdom of God is within me. The other way of interpreting the statement, the kingdom of God is among us, is empowering to us as a community, to everybody here today. It's saying that when we set our minds together, to pursue a mature communal type of love, a mature justice, compassion for each other, that when we set our minds to it, we can create here the kingdom of God, or if you like, the beloved community. And it doesn't matter what the values are out there. And what's really hoped is if we get really strong and good at it here, we can take it out there. Because it isn't just for us who are sitting here. This vision of beloved community, of the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, is for all of us. But I do think it takes a strong community to anchor us, to teach us, to train us, to help us live into our agency and into our empowerment so that when we go into our community, we relate to our neighbors, we operate in our businesses, that we are operating with the same set of values that we have within us and have co-created together here. In Luke, Jesus said the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. It is our experience. It isn't necessarily a thing that we're going to see. It's an experience we're going to have together. And we may see, as was illustrated in our Time for All Ages story, 
acts of kindness and compassion and generosity and sharing, those we can see because we've taken the time to cultivate the blessed community, the kingdom of God within us, and then together we have shared the experience in this community. So that's the good news. It's the news Jesus said was what his life was about during his lifetime and then when he came back. And whatever you think about all of that, I suggest you not get stuck in the details, but that you hear the message, the message of empowerment and the message of love and compassion and that we, we have the agency and the power to create the beloved community. May it be so, and may we always continue to build a new way. Please rise, embody your in spirit as you are willing and able and join in seeking our closing hymn we are building a new way. Actually, our responsive hymn. We are building a new way. We're going to be using, I believe, a video. Yes. Okay, so one of the Unitarian Universalist congregations put together a lovely video of this, um, of this song. It's number 1017 in the Teal Hymnal, and I would suggest that those of you who read music and who like the teal hymnal, pull it out. Uh, and the, the lyrics are in the video. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So please rise as you are willing and able and join us in singing We Are Building a New Way.
So um, please join me in affirming our mission statement. By building a loving religious community that nourishes the spirit, celebrates life, and cherishes the connectedness of all things, we will transform ourselves and our world. Generosity is a spiritual practice one that enlarges the heart, enlightens the spirit. For no matter how much or how little we have, in the sharing of it, both the one who gives and the one who receives are blessed. As an independent universe, Unitarian Universalist congregation, we depend on your financial support to pay our staff, to maintain our beautiful campus, and to offer meaningful worship services and religious exploration programs. We appreciate your generosity and will be good stewards of your contributions. Instructions for online contributions are on the screens. If you are visiting us for the first time, feel free to let the basket pass. Your presence with us today is your gift to us. The morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. Please join me in dedicating the offering. You'll see the words on the screen. May these gifts and the work of our hands and hearts give power to all we stand for as a community of faith. I believe at this point, uh, Julie Kant would like to come up and give us a testimonial on her dedication to this church. Thank you, Scott. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julie Kant, and I've been a member of UEC, UECNH for nearly 12 years. 
on my life journey, I have learned that timing is everything. Whether it's cooking spaghetti al dente for dinner or looking for a new church. When our sons were little, my husband and I were active members of a UU church in eastern Pennsylvania. When Jeff's job brought us to Pittsburgh in the late 1990s, we visited UUCNH a couple of times and even attended, attended what turned out to be a very tumultuous mid-year congregational meeting. For us, the timing was not right, mostly because we were both working full-time and Sunday was our day to recover. But to be honest, the tension in the congregation that year was also a factor. After that, when I was asked about my faith, I would reply that I was a lapsed Unitarian. <laughs> so what brought me back into the fold? Why am I here? this morning telling my story and urging you to pledge in support of our beloved community. It took a profound loss. It took the death of my husband. When Jeff died, I knew I wanted to hold his memorial service in a UU church. I contacted Reverend Scott Rudolph, who conducted a beautiful, meaningful service honoring Jeff. A few weeks later, I came to my first Sunday service and knew almost immediately that I had found a loving, supportive community where I could navigate my new reality. The timing was absolutely right. Since then, my life has expanded in so many ways thanks to the people of this congregation, thanks to you. You rekindled my joy for singing when I joined the choir. You helped me become active in social justice work. You upended my sedentary lifestyle by reintroducing me to the joys of hiking and backpacking. You renewed my love of travel. You provided an outlet for my creativity and you pushed me out of my comfort zone into leadership roles. My life is richer now than I ever expected it would be 12 years ago. I see UUCNH as a place where we intentionally practice kindness and inclusion and are called upon to become our best selves. I've seen how hard this can be, but I've also seen how love and the power of covenant guide us through the tumultuous times. Each year, I make every effort to increase my pledge. I see how your passion and commitment has borne fruit in the progress that we have made towards reducing our carbon footprint and caring for our beautiful grounds. I am thrilled to see new families among us and I anticipate the renewal of our religious education programs. One of my Sunday morning joys is watching the kids listen to the Time for All Ages story, knowing that they are the future of our denomination. I hope we will also expand our partnerships with other justice-seeking groups. In sum, I want the Unitarian Universalist Church of the North Hills to always be here for folks who are striving both to heal themselves and working to mend our broken world. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Regardless of your theology or lack thereof, Jesus' message of hope and empowerment is timeless and can be ever resurrected and celebrated. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are willing and able and join in singing our closing hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, number 268, in the gray hymnal. The words will also appear on the screens.
As we extinguish this flame, may its light be reflected in our hearts, filled with compassion, and our minds filled with wisdom as we strive to build the kingdom of heaven, not in some distant realm, but in the here and now. Let us be agents of the good, spreading kindness and understanding wherever we go. So the, we have a few announcements. The contract to call discernment task force has an announcement. Yes? <laughs> okay. Uh, just a quick update. Uh, so I think I mentioned before we've conducted 13 discernment sessions, uh, reached uh, out to 65 people. We've collected 596 data points if you will, that we're in the process of uh, collating and categorizing uh, and ultimately uh, condensing. Uh, currently, they exist on 19 pages of paper with very small type on them. Uh, we're working to put them into a format that uh, we'll be able to present to you. Uh, simultaneously, uh, uh, these are our focus groups. They're good at collecting ideas. They're not good at putting numbers next to ideas. So we're separately uh, conducting some short uh, polls, uh, which you may have noticed in the e-news that you got on Friday. We've gotten 53 responses uh, so far to those. You still have uh, a day or two uh, to respond to that. We'd very much appreciate your input and hope to keep those coming. Uh, moving forward, just to set some expectations, uh, this week, uh, the discernment task force will be getting together. Uh, so committee members, don't forget Tuesday night. Uh, next week, uh, we will be presenting findings to the board uh, from these sessions. Uh, between this week and next week, uh, we will be uh, presenting findings to uh, Reverend Leanne. Uh, two weeks from today, uh, after church, uh, if all goes according to plan, uh, we will be presenting findings to you. Uh, so uh, if you could, make some time uh, after church to, to hear those uh, and discuss through those. And then two weeks after that, uh, again, if all goes according to plan, uh, we'll be reconvening uh, for a congregational vote. Uh, uh, so that's where we stand so far. Um, obviously, uh, if and when, uh, we make the decision to, to call Reverend Leanne to settled ministry. Uh, we certainly hope uh, that she will continue uh, to be willing to, to serve in that role. Uh, so just between me and you, a, a little secret there. Uh, ministers, like congregants, uh, are attracted to churches uh, that are committed to their mission uh, and show that commitment uh, with their time, talent, and treasurer. Uh, so, yes, uh, what she said. So, <laughs> thank you. Jeff, am I correct in saying that the presentation to the congregation will be Sunday, April 14th? Correct. And that the vote is expected to take place on Sunday, April 28th, for those of you who like to actually have dates. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. So now, <clears throat> at this year's UU General Assembly, we will vote, we Unitarian Universalists, will vote on whether to overhaul Article 2 of the UUA bylaws. The proposed overhaul will remove the seven principles and the six sources from the bylaws and we will replace them with a whole new set of value statements, some of which we've in the ideas behind the principles and sources, but they will no longer be explicitly stated. At our annual meeting here, which the date hasn't been set yet, but I think late June, early, late May, early June timeframe, is that about right? Um, you will have an opportunity to guide 
the UUCNH, this church's delegates, of which I think we have four, who are empowered to vote on behalf of the congregation, you will have an opportunity to, gu to guide them by actually voting on this question of whether or not we should adopt the Article 2 uh, overhaul. All right? So now back in November, the Denominational Affairs Committee began providing information about the proposed amendment in as neutral and objective a way as possible. All right, so if you missed it, go back and look at the e-news in uh, November and December, and you will see that you've been provided with just basic information about here's what we have now, here's what they're suggesting, and here's where the changes are. Now, the Denominational Affairs Committee is sharing resources developed by both the UUA and other UUs in favor of the overhaul and in opposition to the overhaul. Okay, so you're going to start seeing material where people have made a decision whether they are for or against, and they'll be explaining why. This is from other UUs. The Denominational Affairs Committee will be scheduling opportunities to learn more and to discuss your thoughts in small groups before we get to the annual meeting here. Neither the Denominational Affairs Committee nor I will tell you how to vote. The Denominational Affairs Committee is empowered to educate, not to persuade. Okay? So if you're interested in where Unitarian Universalism is going and how the proposals will very much change, the materials we have to work with and the ideas, then you need to take advantage of the information that the Denominational Affairs Committee is sharing. And then hopefully you'll be inspired to participate in some of the discussions and hear what other people are thinking about this before we get to the UUCNH annual meeting. Now, if you'd like to take a deep dive into how the proposed changes will affect us, or you would like to help educate the congregation, please contact Connie Hester. The committee would love to have you join them. So this is going to kind of start slowly and then roll after the vote on April 28th. Then we'll start having some after church opportunities for information sharing and small group discussions because this really is significant. Um, and is worth your attention. And finally, the pledge goal for fiscal year 24-25 is $410,000, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thought I had that right. Currently, $269,974 has been pledged by 38% of our member pledge units and 5% of our friend pledge units. So if you haven't yet pledged, please do so soon in order to assist us in preparing next year's fiscal budget. We are asking you to submit your pledge before April 20th. Now the pledge is just a statement that I feel that I can contribute over the next year a certain amount of money. It can be a one-time payment if that's what suits you. Some of our people who are retired tend to to do that in November and December as they're facing tax consequences. But most people divide that up by 12 months. So a pledge now is to say from July 1st, which begins our next fiscal year, I will uh, contribute a certain amount of money. And those, that contribution can take place in 12-month increments. Given the stats that I just shared with you, clearly if ever, every remaining member and friend would pledge generously, we would easily exceed our goal. 
and be well supported in our efforts to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. See how see what I did there? <laughs> As we prepare to depart from the sacred gathering, let us carry with us the spirit of love, justice, and transformation. And reflecting on the concept of the kingdom of God and Jesus' mission, we are reminded of our own call to embody these ideals in our individual lives. May we go forth with hearts open to the divine spark within each of us, recognizing the inherent worth and dignity of every being we encounter. May we strive to create communities of compassion and understanding where all are welcomed as beloved members of the human family. And may we remember that the work of building the kingdom of God is not confined to any one tradition or belief, but is a collective effort of all who seek to bring about a world of peace and justice. Amen, ashe, and blessed be. May peace be with you until we meet again. Please enjoy the postlude. <laughs>